Hi guys, welcome you all again for the second video regarding the E2BR3. This is the part 2 video and continuation of the part 1. Thank you very much for your support and the valuable comments that what you have provided. I am really happy to see lots and lots of people are really interested to know about the guidelines. I am sure that you will get a complete insight about the E2BR3 guideline from the upcoming videos. We know what is E2BR3 and uh, I have received few queries like to explain about the granularity of the data that what we capture in R3. I am going to give three simple examples that how the granularity of the data is more granular in R3. The first example, the seriousness. In R2, if you want to mention about the seriousness, you can do it at case level. For example, you have three events in a case. The event 1 is serious, the event 2 and 3 are non-serious. When you complete a case and generate the draft of E2BR2, you can see the seriousness at case level, not at the event level. So it is very difficult to distinguish the seriousness of events. You have to read the complete narrative of a case to understand what all the events are serious and non-serious. But in R3, the seriousness can be entered at event level. So without reading the narrative, you can see what all the events and the seriousness criteria for the events. The second example, the country of incidents. For example, a patient experienced an event at country 1 and traveled to country 2 and had some other events there. In R2, the country of incidents should be mentioned at case level. We can mention at case level only in R2. So we have to create a new case and have to process the case separately. But in R3, this can be handled at same case because we will be having the provision to enter the country of incidents at event level. So there is a more granularity in entering the country of incidents at event level. The third example, the causality information that what we are entering right now in R2. So you can mention the causality of a reporter and a marketing authorization holder in a structured field. But in R3, you can mention the causality information of any stakeholders. For example, reporter, uh, marketing authorization holder, sponsor or any other more regulatory authorities at structured fields. So the data will be more granular in nature. Now we are going to see what are the changes they have made in these guidelines. They have completely restructured the numbering of the data and the data elements. They have changed the sum of the data elements, they have removed it and they have amended it and they have repeated it. And uh, they have improved the user guidance. So you can see lots and lots of guidance for the entering of data. They have introduced some of the new concepts called the object identifiers and null flavors. With that help, they have made the code list. So these things we are just going to cover in this video. This is the data structure and numbering of data in E2B R2 and R3. If you compare R2 and R3, we had only two sections in R2. Whereas in R3, we have 10 sections. In E2B R2, A describes about the identification information of your cases. So this A transferred in R3 has 5 sections, that is C1 to C5. The section B, which comprises about the case of your ICSR, which transferred into section D to H. And uh, we will see each and every sections that what actually describes about in R3. So, the section C1 describes about the identification of the case safety report. All the case numbers, case relevant cross reference number mentioned in this section. C2 which describes about the primary source of information is nothing but the reporters. All the reporter information captured in this section. C3 which describes about the sender's information. So the safety information of the sender who is sending the case, the detailed information, the unique number will be mentioned in this section. C4 is for the literature citation 
and C5 is for the study identification like the site number, the subject number of any protocols that what they have actually enrolled in. All this information mentioned in the study identification. So this is the port A of your R2 has been transferred as a C1 to C5. Now we are just going to see the section B of R2 as transferred as D to H. So D talks about the parent patient characteristics. For example, all the relevant histories or patient demographics, all things will be mentioned here. And E regarding your events, all the event and event attributes will be entered here. And the F is completely about the laboratory data associated with your ICSR. And G about the drug. So the suspect drug, concomitant medications, all the informations will be captured in this section. So H about your case narrative as well as the information about the senders and the marketing authorization holders comment about the cases. And if you see some of the data elements are very unique in nature and it will not be repeated and some of the data elements are optional and some of them are very mandatory. So those you can distinguish between these legends. Now we are going to see what are all the changes they have made in the data elements. So I am planning to give a separate video to cover all the aspects of the changes what they have made in the data element. So this is a simple insight about the changes what they have actually made. For example, they have included some of the new data fields. I have mentioned that the causality will be captured in a more granular level. So they have included some of the standard structured fields to capture the causality information. And they have deleted some of the data fields which not required for the R3. And uh, they have repeated some of the data fields and they have amended the field lens of the data fields. So we will be seeing all these things in a separate video. And some of the new concepts has been introduced in your R3 guidelines that is the object identifiers and null flavors. Let me explain you one thing very clearly what is object identifier. It is more of technical. So the database we can segregate in different ways. So previously the relational database now they have converted into a object identification oriented database. So these object identifiers help us to identify the data sets and we can classify the data sets in a hierarchical format. All we need to know about the object identifier is more of technical and which requires for the database management system. And uh, it has its own standards and the standards provided by the International Telecommunications Union. And if you see all the data sets will be classified and uh, mentioned in a number formats. So these help us to identify the data in more detailed level. Null flavors. We know that R3 or R2 all which working under the XML schema. So technically XML allows user to send a blank messages. But if any fields has been in blank, it had no value to the case. So we should have to mention why the information has not been provided. So the authority decided to give some of the null values for the blank information that what we are sending it. So you can see lots and lots of null flavors that has been used in R3 to explain why the data element has not been filled or captured. So it will give you the insight that whether the information is absent or they have not provided due to the data privacy or any other reason why the data element has not been shared with the stakeholders. These are all the code list as per the OID concept. So each information here will be assigned with a particular OID. Currently we have 51 OIDs 
the code list so in future there may be chances that some of the data elements also can be classified and provided with the specific oid the object identifiers for the database maintenance guys i believe the second part of this video also more informative for you guys and if you need any specific topics or you have any questions please comment and we will discuss in the next videos if you want to know more about this please subscribe it to get the notification thank you all bye bye